I have five. Sorry? I have 535, so I think you're up. <laughs> All right. <laughs> are we recording now? It looks like we are. Okay, beautiful. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Poma Prempe. I am your moderator for this awesome panel on the pandemic, disability, and parenting. I am coming to you live from my kitchen, um, and I'm sure many of you are watching the same way. Um, before we begin our panel, um, we want to acknowledge the land that we are, well, that many of us are watching and participating and living, working, and playing on. And so the area known as Tikaranto is the traditional territory of the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Wendat, and the Métis peoples. This territory is covered by Treaty 14 and the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, which represents our duty to share and take care of this land. Our ability to live, work, and play on this land has been guaranteed by the systemic oppression and genocide of Aboriginal people. We acknowledge that the legacy of res residential schools, the 60s scoop, and the child welfare systems resulting from them have stripped Aboriginal people of the chance to parent and be parented. This is a sobering truth reflected in the 215 children discovered in an unmarked grave at Kamloops Indian Residential School on May 27, 2021. We support the pursuit of justice and significant reparations for these children and their families. We acknowledge the lack of resources and disproportionate violence faced by disabled Aboriginal people. We continue to work in solidarity with Indigenous communities in the pursuit of intersectional and anti-colonial justice. Wonderful. And so um, next, I want to lay out um, how our awesome panel will go. We have three wonderful panelists. We have Terry Lynn. Terry Lynn Lang, if you want to <laughs> say hi, wave. We have Ingrid Palmer, you want to say hi. And we have Krista Couture as well. Hi, everyone. Um, we also um, want to thank the Sorry, one moment. <laughs> uh, the Center for Global Disability Studies and the Rehabilitation Sciences Institute at the University of Toronto. Um, their small grants helped us bring this panel to life and their support is very appreciated. And so we want to acknowledge that. Um, I believe Professor Miriam Lowe from University of Toronto School of Cities wanted to chime in and say hello just before we ensue with our amazing talks and just this great conversation that we have going today. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Puma, for your kind words and introductions. Uh, I'm very delighted uh, to uh, to be here today to learn from all of you, but first and foremost to thank Terry Lynn and her collaborators for having put together this critical, timely, and very crucial conversation. So thank you to all the panelists for having made time in your very busy schedule to be here today to share with us your experiences and to give us an opportunity to learn from you on the broad topic uh, that you have you know, so identified today, disability, the pandemic, and parenting. So thank you so much. And uh, we look forward to a very lively generative conversation. So I put it back to you and the honor is all ours. And we're so delighted to have had Terry uh, with us and all of you today to have brought this in important conversation uh, in our community. So thank you so much. It's just with gratitude that I'm here today just to welcome you and to thank you for this very important initiative. Thank you so much. Wonderful, thank you. Okay, um, thank you for coming to this discussion today and thank you um, Professor Lowe for that um, brief introduction. And thank you Poma for, um, for introducing the talk today. I have a brief description of myself. I'm a white woman in her late thirties with long brown hair and glasses with a petite frame and I'm a manual wheelchair user. My pronouns are she and her. I very much appreciate the opportunity to organize and speak at this event today. And I wish to thank all of the organizer, organizers, including Catherine Danks at the School of Cities, Professor Lowe 
um, at the School of Cities, Poma Prema uh, at George Brown College, who did a significant amount of work um, on this project. Adam Al Mazari, also of School of Cities, Miggy Esteban at the Social Justice Education at U of T, and Christopher and Matt, who are ASL interpreters today. Um, oh, Christopher and Matt, did you want to do a brief introduction before I continue? Can you guys hear me? Now I can, yes. Okay. Uh, Christopher and Matt, did you want to do a brief introduction before I continue? Okay. Um, can, can folks hear me still? Okay. I just wanted to say a few words on uh, Valentina Azrova Sancher. There is an urgent Palestinian humanitarian crisis at this time that requires our attention. Valentina Azrova has dedicated her life and academic work to human rights concerns, particularly the human rights and human rights violations of Palestinians, and attention must be paid to this. I would encourage folks to engage with sources such as Amnesty International and the um, United Nations General Assembly Committee on the exercise of the inalienable rights of Palestinian people. U of T has faced significant but warranted criticisms over this job loss. Um, as Rova's employment should be restored as the job is clearly hers. Um, there are horrific human rights concerns that require our attention today. 215 Indigenous children were found in mass graves in, at a residential school in Kamloops, BC. Poma spoke eloquently about this in her land acknowledgement today. I am calling on past residential schools and administrators to release the records of these children both to deceased and living, to their families, and where possible to the public. Indigenous and Black families continue to experience higher rates of systemic abuse from so-called children's aid systems across Ontario and Canada. Um, in the news, there have um, been many reports of Islamophobia, which is on the rise and has had deadly consequences for this diverse community. This is the backdrop that many families experience within Canada. As a parent, um, when the pandemic hit, I assumed that I would have to explain to my toddler um, what the pandemic was and how COVID-19 was spread. And yet so um, many more horrendous things have occurred in a time period that we are describing in pre-pandemic, pandemic and post-pandemic times. It is a time period that we are describing in waves, first, second, and third. Sometimes what is top of mind is waves of grief as we have lost so many people globally and not just to the virus itself, but to acts of violence and violent systems that reinforce whose lives are worth living and saving and whose are not. Sorry, I have to, one second. Uh, the pandemic and whether or not people become ill and whether or not disability is acquired does discriminate in that regard and it always has. How does one explain all of that and the gravity of it all to children? When the pandemic hit in March of 2019, my baby girl was almost 17 months old. I loved our life and the stability within it and we also loved daycare. At daycare, JC got messy with the water table, painting, crafting, and socializing with her toddler friends. To my amazement and annoyance, JC also loved all forms of public transit, being somewhat oblivious to the fact that public transit is completely inaccessible to us. Always having a way with words, JC would delight at seeing a streetcar and a bus, saying streetcar, bus, beep, beep. All of that stopped when the pandemic hit um, Toronto and my very outgoing child started aggressively biting our hands and became tearful easily um, when all of our routines were suddenly not routine anymore. The hand biting lasted for a little more than two weeks until we nervously moved into what was going to be a new routine for us. JC would become tearful because people in the lobby who would typically say hello to us were walking away. 
There were no more uppy ups with neighbors or acquaintances and no more games of peekaboo or hide and seek with neighbors kids in the lobby. The parks had so much less to offer. JC is a very social child and her opener when she meets someone new is to ask, hey, what's your superpower? JC will tell you with flapping hands and jumping feet that her superpower is being friendly. That is the core of her being. What is a little girl to do when she can't use her superpower of friendliness in the same way? For a friendly superhero, meeting other children in the park became extremely more difficult. In particular, I was very nervous to go to the park and I feel like JC could feel that. As a disabled parent, I could um, not turn this anxiety off. In order to go to the park, we need a nurturing assistant, an attendant that is trained to support disabled parents with physical disabilities who have young children. Um, these folks don't live with us, and there were thin policy provisions at the time that noted this group as an exception when talking about and thinking through congregate groups in public spaces. I was concerned that we might be stopped by security services at the parks, a presence that was more visible in Toronto and had deepened in my view. In public spaces where I am seen actively parenting my child, we have experienced very direct hate from some strangers that are vocal about parents with disabilities, with one person saying that our so-called defective genes are not welcomed in society. That was a grocery store incident. In a previous talk, I spoke briefly about abject violence I've experienced as a disabled parent, and I'm not sharing those experiences today. As a family, we were policed in other ways, as JC and I went to Shoppers Drug Mart with a nurturing assistant one day, someone else in line had said that we were breaking all of the rules because we were obviously not from the same household. Um, our hours for nurturing assistance are generally 6.30 to 9.30, and some of those um, folks were still traveling home after the temporary curfew was imposed. This made me nervous as well. These were predominantly young racialized workers living in population dense areas that had been hit hard by COVID ticketing and areas known as hotspots. We also live in a hotspot area in Toronto. On top of being scrutinized in public for being a parent with a visible disability during the pandemic, disabled people were denied PPE, deprioritized for care in the ICU, and to my disgust, medical assistance in dying with the adoption of Bill C-7 is in full force in Ontario. I'm well aware that we are devalued. These anti-disability policies notwithstanding, I'm well aware that we are often unloved. When COVID-19 first hit, access to food became more difficult for our family. We could not find any time slots for many weeks that would facilitate grocery delivery in Toronto. And so we had to spend some time, some attendant care time um, going to grocery stores and seeking out the most basic of food items like frozen vegetables and burritos. Needing help with these tasks during the pandemic that I would be able to do on my own in pre-pandemic circumstances is one of the expenses that the disability community has had to absorb in this time period. These extra expenses were ignored by governments um, as very few people with disabilities qualified for the SERP payments and many folks on ODSP were denied them altogether. In the pandemic, our lives counted for less and aid to these communities was cheapened in public policy. Access to doctor's appointments during this time has been extremely difficult as well. It would have been um, helped tremendously in JC's first year if our postpartum medical visits were all home visits. Since the pandemic started, I feel less well in my body, having much less access to supportive therapies that sustain me like acupuncture and physiotherapy. I have had two specialist appointments this week alone because all of those annual visits were postponed. As I mentioned anxiety, I have historically experienced um, complex developmental post-traumatic stress. The pandemic has been stressful and anxiety provoking, if nothing else. 
However, it is accurate to say that having JC has been a blessing upon blessings and her birth and existence um, has brought about a peacefulness in myself and a calmness to my mind. My child is love, loved. She represents to me a radical way of being because I am visibly disabled and openly bisexual, two identities that are shunned in the world as two groups who ought not to parent. So I do need to say that a radical self-love got me to this place as a parent and it has a ripple effect. I didn't arrive at this place on my own. There was a family whose child was dying when I volunteered in hospice care who five years earlier had said that I would be a great mother one day and my paternal grandmother who strongly believed in the same. These acts of love are rare and precious. I believe that my child can feel this radical self-love and healing. I believe that she can feel the love I have for disabled people and folks in the 2S LGBTQ plus community at many in and at many intersections. Oh, I just lost my place. <laughs> of course. Um, okay. Um, okay, doctor's appointments. Okay. The ways that I connect with JC are intimately connected to my identity as a disabled parent. When I was pregnant with JC, she was most relaxed when I was exercising in my chair using wheelchair dancing or rolling down hills to sing a lullaby to my womb. When JC arrived, it was um, similar gentle movements in a seated position that would help her to relax and get to sleep. When JC was an infant, there was a particular way that we both learned to be with each other. We learned to hang, she learned to hang on to my shirt and to sit on my lap so that we could both just be together. I say this because able-bodied folks are very committed to bouncing babies while walking. And I would hear this from many well-meaning able-bodied people. They would say, hey, I know what will help. She just needs to bounce, that'll do it. As if to say a disabled parent is incapable of soothing their own child simply because they cannot walk. Although this is never the intention, this is a perfect, perfect example of able-bodied um, arrogance. I can say that while JC enjoyed this type of movement, the movements that really relaxed her involved the back and forth of my wheelchair. Recently, JC has refused to walk to daycare, so I put her in my lap and I push her down two hallways despite being a big girl. JC has repeatedly asked me when she will get her own wheelchair, and I can only report that she is envious of our access tools. This is proof that ableism and exclusion of all kinds are taught. I believe that I am teaching JC about a politic of equity and diversity. JC has been immersed into a world of disability and we know other diverse families. JC finds ways to include me very easily in ways that make any inclusion and diversity department fail by comparison. I suspect that this is because she doesn't grapple with the mindset of whether or not, of whether I should be included or not. She knows that's not a question or maybe it's a requirement. What a gift. COVID-19 from um, the perspective of a toddler has been fascinating. One day, um, JC was listening to the news, which is rare for us because our TV is typically set to children's programming. JC stopped, listened to a segment about COVID-19 and while drinking yogurt. She said, mama, what's going on? So many things are going on. And then she said, the world is foxed. What's that, JC asked? The world is foxed, she said again. I realized that she was saying foxed, F-O-X-E-D. She was trying to drop the F-bomb as I do swear sometimes. I laughed out loud from my belly and I said, oh my God, that's so accurate. And I said, that's right, JC, the world is foxed and your rule in it is to show kindness, friendliness and love. Um, so that so ends my talk. Um, I would like to pass it along to Krista, um, Krista and Ingrid, um, if that's okay. And uh, we can just have um, their talks and or just answer questions that we had passed along to the panel. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Terry Lynn. 
Um, I'm Krista Couture. My pronouns are she and her. A brief description of myself. I'm a, a white woman in my early 40s with dark hair that's pulled back into a ponytail. I'm wearing a like an olive green shirt. I'm sitting in front of a gallery wall of artwork and posters that is in my office slash bedroom. <laughs> And uh, I'm really honored to be here and, and, and thankful for the invitation to join this event. I'm a writer and a musician and a broadcaster currently based in Toronto. I'm originally from Treaty 6 territory. Um, I've been here seven years. I lived in Vancouver for, for 17 years before that. And I'm queer, I'm disabled, I'm a mom. Um, my disability I acquired when I was 13. I, when I was 11, I was diagnosed with bone cancer, Ewing sarcoma in my left fibula. And after chemotherapy and radiotherapy failed as treatments, the cure for my cancer was to amputate my left leg above the knee. And so um, my uh, disability that, that where I'm disabled is uh, in facing mobility issues and barriers. My daughter is uh, three and a half, just over three and a half. And when I think of how I connect with her um, in a way that honors who I am as a disabled parent, I often think of this article that a, a, a friend of mine posted on Facebook, you know, Facebook, um, a very non-disabled centric article that was talking about how um, adults need to get on the ground with their kids more and crawl more and people don't do that enough. And I thought, gosh, I crawl on the floor all the time <laughs> when I don't have my prosthesis on. And, and I, especially when my daughter was an infant, I really loved um, that I was used to that world with her in a way. And that in some ways it's easier for me to move around on the floor than on crutches or with my prosthesis sometimes. Um, and we designed our, our world on that level. I mean, of course it would be for her anyway, but um, I enjoyed that I kind of already knew that terrain in a way that, that non-disabled people don't or wouldn't. It felt sort of like our world down there together. And uh, so much of the things that we do together, you know, are centered around what I can do. And, um, you know, that we, do artwork and reading and music together. Um, and then their supports and my, my partner, her other mom, who is able to, who's non-disabled and is in charge of some of the other more active stuff. Um, during, during the pandemic, when it started, there was a few, you know, obviously massive changes for so many of us. I think um, I felt grateful in a way that at her age, she wasn't, um, you know, I, I, like I think so much in the last year of teenagers and adolescents who've been on this verge of independence and who should be out of the house and 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 haven't been able to because um, we were already home so much of the time. And while her schedule changed a little bit, she wasn't in daycare. And so there wasn't that adjustment. But she did notice, you know, that everything was closed, that the library was closed, that the coffee shop was closed, that the playgroup was closed, our, our usual, uh, uh, the, our haunts, our usual haunts. And for me, the way that this uh, introduced challenges is that I relied on those spaces for um, kind of breaking up our day and giving me a rest. Um, because for me, um, the challenge in my day is just meeting my capacity, reaching my limit of what I can physically do as far as pain management and fatigue. And so when I, before I was able to take her to the library or the play group, I could sit down and she's very shy, but usually eventually would start to veer off. And that for me was a time to sit and rest and, and have other people interacting um, and provide that break. And then of course, not being able to go to um, other friends' houses or have people come over and also help with that um, uh, social break. Those for us and with my disability, our supports are our friends and family. And we don't have family in Toronto, but so are mostly our friends and chosen family. And I really noticed the impact of that. I really noticed um, the increased physical demand of uh, particularly in the beginning, keeping a busy three-year-old uh, at the time, two-year-old, um, keeping her busy and keeping her entertained and that uh, it was really draining and uh, 
lonely. I mean, motherhood and parenting can be lonely with little ones. You already feel isolated, I think, in the best circumstances. Um, and and non-disabled parents feel that too. And so all of these increased uh, ways of feeling tired and alone. Um, and, but I did find, I mean, once it was summer, we're really fortunate to have a backyard um, and because the, yeah, the playgrounds became strange and scary. And so we had some green space and when the weather was warmer, that made it easier. Uh, but the winter was long. That winter was long. I have come up with all kinds of crafts <laughs> that I probably would not have come up if we could go anywhere else. Um, so it's been a time of a lot of creativity and really maxing out our just personal resources, um, which I think is true for all parents. But again, just reaching our capacity, for me, reaching my capacity during the day and going, wow, we still have hours to go. Um, so I feel tired. <laughs> I feel worn out. Um, and I, as far as ableism during the pandemic, I mean, from my location, what I felt, um, I'm quite frustrated with certainly in the beginning was, um, non-disabled people experiencing perhaps for the first time in their life, those levels of isolation, um, and limited social circles and barriers and not being able to go to certain places and, and people articulating how hard that was, like they'd never thought of it before. <laughs> like they didn't think about how other people might live with that all the time. And I found I didn't have uh, a lot of tolerance <laughs> for, for people expressing that. I mean, I say that and it's, it's a bit, it's judgmental, I know. But, you know, cause it was real, it was so real, that's where they were at. But this like frustration of like, do you not realize that a lot of people feel this way? <laughs> And then in turn, this sort of uh, uh, very fast um, turnaround to make uh, some workplaces, you know, for people to be able to work from home and getting people laptops and gear to do that and, and the, the proliferation of Zoom meetings and, and even having arts events streamed online, which they could have been streamed this whole time. Um, all of these efforts that were made so that people could access and connect to the world from home. Um, the fact that those weren't made before when so many people have asked for them, so many disabled people have said, we could do this. <laughs> um, I felt angry <laughs> and at the same time, great, see, look, it's possible. It's easy even, um, but but f sad that, that it took it impacting non-disabled people to introduce um, that kind of access. Um, and so that, that's some of the things that I've noticed this year. Um, and I think in other ways with my disability, what I experience a lot in parenting um, that I, I don't e experience as much otherwise, my, my disability can be concealed. If I wear pants and I stand very still, <laughs> Um, I will pass for non-disabled. Um, most often I keep my prosthesis, I make it visible and my prosthetic leg is covered in this floral print. And so if, if people see it, it is, um, it's striking, it's very visibly a fake leg. And when I go out in the world, some people might ask me about it or comment on it. Um, but being with my, my daughter in the playground and certainly pre pandemic pre-pandemic and being in public places with her and being around other kids all the time, um, I've really experienced their responses to my difference and witnessed their parents' responses. Um, and I feel like I've encountered so, so many more horrible comments and inappropriate questions than I ever had before because parents haven't taught their kids how to ask those questions and not ask those questions, or um, they aren't equipped on how to, to support their kid who doesn't know something. Um, this year, a, a friend of mine published a book called What Happened to You? And it, it features a, a little kid um, with limb difference. And um, I've told so many people about the book because I'm, I'm tired of being the first amputee that kids see or meet. It, kids shouldn't be five years old and have never seen that before um and uh and i i realize that a lot when i'm in playgrounds and in public places with my daughter and kids come up to me and 
say things and touch my leg and all kinds of stuff. And, um, and so I've been kind of learning how to navigate those questions in a way that I haven't in a long time, um, because I just haven't, I haven't been faced with it. And so while I miss being in those spaces and being able to see my daughter playing with other kids and stuff, I don't really miss those questions, <laughs> um, <laughs> but they'll come back with everything else. Um, so those are some of my, my thoughts on this year and how uh, parenthood and, and my disability interact. Um, and I think Ingrid is going to share next. Thank you. There, I think I got it. Can you hear me? <laughs> I see my box is kind of lit up. So hopefully that means you can hear me. Uh, my name is Ingrid Palmer. I'm a black woman with long uh, dreadlocks and I'm wearing a black dress. Uh, I'm visually impaired. Um, I was diagnosed uh, when I was 14 years old with retinitis pigmentosa, which is a rare um, degenerative eye disorder. So I've basically been slowly going blind my whole life. Um, every year of my life, I could see the difference in my vision and would have to um, adjust um, accordingly and have been doing so ever since. <laughs> um, uh, when I was 16 years old, I was also further diagnosed with um, polycystic ovary syndrome, uh, which affects about 10% of women. Um, so hit the jackpot there, two rare disorders in one person. Um, and so uh, polycystic ovary syndrome uh, is also a hormone imbalance. And so as a result of having elevated levels of testosterone, um, I began to grow um, a beard uh, when I was 18 and um, which quickly spread. My sideburns grew in and uh, my beard grew and um, I chose to shave and do, but I am left with a visible shadow. And so socially I am perceived as being a transgendered woman. And so being a black woman with a disability, um, I also grew up in, in foster care. And um, with that uh, perception, the overlaying um, levels of um, discrimination and stigma and oppression that I have experienced um, in my life has uh, obviously been multiplied um, than if it was just one. Um, and I first became a parent uh, when I was 21, <laughs> my first year in college. I now have three children, um, which is awesome because I was told that I wouldn't be able to. <laughs> so haha, um, you know, that's uh, kudos to not you know, taking what doctors say as, um, you know, as gospel, which I used to. I used to think that doctors know everything and everything they say is like, you know, the end. Um, so my parenting journey has uh, been very interesting. I certainly, with all three of my kids, knew that I was being surveilled and watched in the hospital um, each time. But of course, with each experience, I I expected it. I knew that the encounter would be there and was better able to navigate it. But the fact that uh, persons with disability have to navigate such an experience at all is um, uh, pretty disgusting. Um, but uh, that's just one among uh, many things that we are forced to endure in our society. And so I'm going to go through um, the series of four questions. Um, that were sent out. And so the first one asked, um, what are some of the ways that you connect with your children in relation to um, disability that honors um, your location as a disabled parent? And so as a visually impaired uh, parent, voice is a huge connector for me. Voice is a significant part of my vision. Um, my children's voices fill in the missing pieces for me. They make sense of the jumble of shades and hues um, that I see. They describe the action taking place uh, whenever we watch um, 
TV, watch a movie or a show, I am constantly like, what's happening? What's going on? Um, so it's, it's not a quiet affair <laughs> with me. Um, and I, I, a lot of times I sit in between um, two of them. So they're, they're each in my ear telling me uh, different things, um, but it helps to fill in um, what I see because I tell my children that I have to interpret what I see. I have to try and make sense of the pieces that are there. So their voices help me do that. Um, when they point out what it is, I'm suddenly able to, to see it. <laughs> Not of course, because my vision has suddenly improved, but their explanations just, just bring it to life um, for me. And so um, their voices you know, are important to me. They explain, they direct, and they give assurance to me, and they offer me words of love and acceptance and encouragement. Um, and we connect also through physical touch. Um, you know, um, their hands guide me, their legs, you know, when we snuggle, intertwine with mine, overlay mine, uh, warm hugs that, you know, surprise me during the day, um, prodding elbows that also move me out of their way, uh, being stepped on or, or, you know, elbowed without apology, because, you know, it's just mom, don't really have to be uh, polite with mom. Um, my touching of their faces and, and bodies is another uh, big connector for me. Um, it, it's mostly welcome, except when, you know, my hands accidentally connect with, um, you know, areas that they don't want. <laughs> my daughter um, tells me that is no longer appropriate because, you know, when they were little, you know, you know, accidentally touching their chest or bum was not a big deal. Uh, but now it produces squeals and protests and I have to make hasty uh, apologies. Um, lack of accommodation, consideration, or sometimes assistance is a reverse, um, really intimate respect between us. Um, the pile of shoes that lay cluttered in the hallway, despite my constantly requesting that they not do that, um, it contradicts the way that they very carefully uh, remember to make sure that the cupboard doors are closed, that I don't bag my head. But both of these things say that we don't see your disability. Uh, we only see your capacity uh, because my children really do see me as capable. And I'm just mom. I'm not a disabled mother. Um, and they, they know that I get things done. Uh, so both the ways in which uh, my children help me and they don't help me uh, both speak to their love of me and the way that they see me as full and complete and not deficient in any way. Um, we connect also through laughter, um, especially at all the silly, <laughs> um, interesting and random things um, that can happen that only happen because I'm visually impaired, such as um, today, um, the black balloon on the floor I, I thought was the cat and attempted to pet it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> pretty funny, but who else could that happen to, right? Um, that wouldn't happen if I didn't have this disability. And so the, the, the things that happen to me, the mishaps, the missteps, they just provide um, fodder for our birthday roast where the guest of honor, you know, gets mercilessly teased. I mean, I get told about all the really incredibly <laughs> ridiculous and, and funny things um, that I have done and do. And it teaches us that um, our mistakes and our missteps don't define us. Like they're just something to laugh about and, and, and move on. And that's something um, that is, is pretty rich for me that, that my family um, gets that message and that that message is directly related um, to my disability. Um, my children now read to me uh, because I can no longer read to them. And that's also a really nice turn of events. That isn't something that I would have chosen. I would love to still be able to read to my children, but being read to is also uh, really nice and really intimate. Um, so from the perspective of being a parent, um, Something about uh, me uh, that has changed since COVID hit. Um, definitely, you know, as a person with a disability, I'm always 
uh, juggling that need for independence and that need for assistance or support from others in some ways. And um, it's a delicate balance and definitely the, pande the pandemic uh, did affect uh, my independence. Um, it was definitely curtailed and my reliance on, um, on my partner, on my husband was uh, definitely had to be increased. And then he had to take care of everything that required doing on the outside because I would not be able to adequately socially distance um, on my own. And so, you know, and I'm not a person that likes to be reliant. There were plenty of things pre-pandemic that I did on my own. I, I traveled on my own. I had the use of wheel trans. And so I could go wherever I wanted and do whatever I wanted. And I didn't have to rely or wait, you know, for my husband to not be working or to go around his schedule, um, which is what you have to do if you don't have a mode of, of traveling on your own. So that came to um, a complete halt. Um, I did enjoy having my family at home. I have to say all the time. <laughs> I didn't mind having uh, my kids at home. Of course, at this time they were older. Uh, when the pandemic started, my youngest um, was 10 and my eldest um, was 25. Um, so, you know, I, I wasn't trying to entertain and keep busy toddlers at that time, which I can I definitely appreciate and remember is a definitely a, a labor of love. Um, so being able to unplug uh, for a while and getting to spend time uh, with the children and getting to know them on a deeper level because the time was just so much more accessible uh, now that we were all home together. Um, in the beginning, it was it was rather fun. Um, I enjoyed spending more time with them and, and felt like I was getting to know them on a deeper level. We had way more opportunity to talk to each other and to listen to each other. But of course, as the pandemic stretched on, um, you know, uh, mental health concerns um, definitely became more apparent. Um, definitely uh, with the kids, it was really hard to be separated from their friends so much. It was no longer fun um, to be out of school and, and you know, the adventure that it, it seemed at the beginning, now learning was, was more tedious than ever before. And as a parent trying to um, help them to stay engaged in, in online learning, um, because, you know, we had certain high risks, so I was not going to um, have them go to in-person school. Um, but that definitely brought its own challenges and being visually impaired, you know, kids are kids. They're definitely going to um, try to get away with things and because that's what kids do. And as parents, we do our best to, to catch them and to foil their efforts. And But when you're visually impaired, of course, that it becomes rather tricky. And I am a keen listener and can detect certain things just by listening. But of course, there, there are others that, that will go um, undetected. And so trying to balance keeping them engaged in school, keeping them uh, doing their best, and also being you know, aware and compassionate about the time period we're in um, was also necessary. So um, that was um, definitely something um, that I had to do. In terms of speaking, of continuing to speak about a mental health experience of disabled parents in general that I knew, I really um, feel that, you know, I, I always say kudos to our community and are, are always um, you know, in awe, even myself, of, of our resiliency and our ability and, and our amazing depth and capacity. Because tackling adversity and managing setbacks is just the norm for us. We live, we exist in that space. Um, you know, and, uh, but uh, of course, I'm not saying that our resilience isn't compromised, but we are forced out of necessity uh, because of how. Um, we are treated in society and for our continuous lack of supports that existed, you know, even pre-pandemic, um, that we have to be creative. We are, you know, indeed a complex mix of vulnerability and uh, strength 
Um, but we live our lives in that sphere. So, you know, as, as a whole, I feel like the, the myself and, and most of the parents that I know that we kept on doing uh, what we do. And that was to be creative, to let some things go, um, to deal with what we could, what we had control over, um, to laugh at the folly of society and the government on one moment and, and curse them to painful deaths the next um, because of the crap that we have to deal with. Um, you know, persons with disabilities live in uncertainty and pivot as a norm. And in many ways, I feel like we were, you know, of course, better equipped to deal with the pandemic living than anyone else. We were the experts, you know, and I encouraged um, people that called me for consultations and to ask about things. I was like, why don't you just ask a disabled person? Like, they know, you know, they can, they can tell you, you know, what to do and how to do this. You know, that's what you, that's who you should be talking to, you know, and, and not just myself, but, but others, because we didn't crumble, you know, um, and uh, we didn't see that there was no light at the end of the tunnel or freak out because our kids are, are missing school or that they, they're going to have a couple of years that aren't, you know, stellar in education and so their lives are going to be ruined and now everything's off the tracks. Like I heard a lot of able-bodied able people talking about because they're not used to being in this um, uncertain landscape where we always live, you know? And so we can hold uncertainty in one hand and responsibility in the other, and we still manage to maneuver and navigate through the shit storm and come out the other end, bruised and battered, but still ticking. That is, you know, what we do um, in general as a rule. And so um, with, and that's not saying, or I, I wanna be sure to say that I'm not trying to um, lightly go over um, the really serious issues that, that people, uh, many people in our community um, did experience. Um, but I also really love the opportunity to highlight our strength, our resiliency, and our capacity, um, that we are like really strong and capable and um, all of us, and that doesn't matter what we go through, our emotional strength is unparalleled, unparalleled to anyone else. And um, with respect to the communities um, that I work with and engagement, um, this pandemic is a continuous cycle um, for us for, you know, not, having um, been, it, it's a cycle that hasn't been broken. It's a recurrence that, you know, we're, we're always have been marginalized and considered disposable and the pandemic and any times of emergency or disaster or stress for society, we are pushed down even more. Um, we live in this hierarchical society where disability is still seen as deficient and our lives um, considered to be disposable, as Terry Lynn talked about um, in her, her, her talk earlier on um, in the, the medical uh, field. We really saw that disgusting triage and, and the way that um, our lives were chosen to be um, disposable and that if it came down to us and uh, somebody that was able-bodied, that the able-bodied person, um, you know, reflexively was their life was considered to be more worthy um, of saving than a disabled person's life. So this continuance of us being low factored and dismissible uh, definitely continued and was highlighted in the pandemic. Um, the systemic, the attitudinal and the social barriers um, that we are forced to navigate and jump hoops through that are you know, strongly tied to our existence um, didn't change. That definitely increased. And especially so for Black, Indigenous, and other racialized communities, um, because when you add those intersectional layers on top of disability, the negative impacts from society are just incredibly um, magnified. Um, and, and that continued to play out in the pandemic. Um, there have been persistent gaps affecting um, disabled black and, and racialized and other marginalized groups um, that were exacerbated by the pandemic, including an increase in food insecurity, an increase of job loss, 
an increase of the necessity, as Terry Lynn also mentioned, with of having not being able to take time off work, of being forced to continue to work. Uh, you know, many did not have uh, the privilege of of being able um, to stay home. And for, for those in our community that were on ODSP and they had that little top up, that instead of being universally given to everyone automatically, that they required that it be asked for, disgusting. Um, you could not get through to workers. The lines were incredibly busy. And if you did get through, the voicemails were full. There were many, many people that were not able to access that benefit, not because of lack of need or want, but that they were prevented from being able to access it because they were required to ask for it. I'm still not over that. That was just such a disgusting display of, of ableism. And you know, and and I believe um, I'm so sorry I forgot your name. The second speaker who spoke um, uh, talked about this sudden um, support when able-bodied people were affected. This sudden of all these access that we could have for theater and entertainment and, and concerts and all these things that suddenly became available and and it was so easy. And how you know our community was refused pre-pandemic who were seeking employment but needed to work remotely. Oh no, that was impossible. That was ridiculous doing that really. And now it's preferred and they're talking about not even going back um, all the way to in-person, uh, you know, because when able-bodied people are affected all of a sudden, oh no, this is an emergency. But when it affects only uh, disabled bodies, then oh, not that big a deal. You know, we don't have, oh, it's impossible to do it. It's too hard to do for you. Um, you know, so I, I really also really felt that and that really also resonated with me and was not lost. Um, so the pandemic definitely brought um, non-disabled people into, you know, some reality about what other people have been living with as a norm. And I really hope that that awakening that they've had stays um, post pandemic and that people, you know, don't just suddenly uh, forget because they are able now to navigate out of that. Um, because for many of us that that didn't, it wasn't something new and it won't change uh, when the pandemic lifts. And when we are raising our voices and calling for change, I really want uh, those voices of able-bodied people who now don't have to imagine what it's like. I mean, they have to imagine what it's like all the time, but they've had over a year now to live it in a way themselves, uh, partially. And so I would really want uh, for those voices to now join ours and demand that change happens um, for our benefit. And um, so I'm going to stop talking there and um, see if maybe we're going to have, um, I don't know, a free for all style talk. Terry Lynn. Hi, you did such a great job. <laughs> I was just gonna say, <laughs> that was amazing. I was like nodding the whole time. <laughs> so excited. Um, Maggie, I'm wondering if there are questions. Hi everyone, Miggy speaking. Uh, we don't have any questions yet. However, I'll let everyone know that, um, well, first of all, I'd like to thank Terry Lynn, Ingrid and Krista for a wonderful, uh, their wonderful generosity of sharing. Um, I wanna let everyone attending know that they can post their questions via the chat. They can also, if they prefer email, um, this email address I just posted, pandemicdisabilityandparenting at gmail.com. If you would like to ask a question out loud, you're also more than welcome to raise your hand and we can allow you to um, share your microphone and ask a question out loud. Um, so those are the three ways. If you'd like to ask a question, you're more than welcome to. Hi, this is Krista. Can I just jump in and, and, and share a couple things that I, um, sort of got from Ingrid talking. Is that okay? If I just, well, there's maybe some questions coming. Okay. Um, 
I, I, there was so much that you, 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 I also was nodding and, and connecting to um, the ways that I saw myself and what you were sharing, Ingrid. And, and when you were describing um, your kids leaving shoes in the hall, um, <laughs> even though you've asked them not to, I really appreciated your reframing that it's because they don't, they, they see you as capable. And I think that's actually really beautiful. And that's useful to me, you know, if my daughter being young and, and learning how to navigate that stuff with her. Um, because of course she, you know, loves and accepts me and I'm her mom and, and, and my limb difference, there's nothing strange about it to her. It's totally, um, I'm not different to her. We will encounter things that are, are different, but, um, but the other day she took my crutches from me and would not give them back. And, and was really, you know, she was watching me and she, we were having a little standoff and I was kind of figuring out how to navigate it in the moment because she was, I mean, she's learning, right? And so she was sort of testing it and seeing what would happen. And, and, um, and I was figuring out how to say like, that's not okay. Please don't take my crutches. And also, you know, how could we apply that to other situations or when we encounter, you know, other people and, Anyway, so I love how um, um, how you talked about that and how I imagine this will continue, <laughs> that she will continue to test or forget or, you know, and that could be out of love and it could be out of questioning or, um, so I really appreciated that. I also had the experience of being told I wouldn't uh, be able to conceive um, due to the chemotherapy that I had as a kid, um, which my doctors shared with me at 18 at the time, I was not thinking at all of parenting. So I was like, fine, whatever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but it, it mattered to me later. Um, and I have actually been pregnant four times and they were totally wrong about that. And uh, I'm glad that they were. And, uh, and yeah, I just also appreciated how important it is to not always take what they say as the truth. Um, <laughs> I experienced that too. I also wanted to thank you for lifting up how you enjoyed the extra time with your family. I didn't describe that, but it's it was true for us too. Um, and I think as a unit, like because um, uh, my daughter wasn't yet in daycare, like we were managing um, childcare between my partner and I, but it was always very much a like passing of the baton, you know, it could sort of feel like ships in the night with a little one, right? Where we weren't always getting to see each other, but we both had time with our, with our daughter. And, and I, during the pandemic, it started to be the three of us, the three of us as a family and the three of us nurturing that, that time. And I, um, as far as this last year, that piece I'm very grateful for. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of really beautiful times as a family that we wouldn't have had otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, but I can imagine with older kids that that would be, would be special. Because of course, at, with my daughter at her age, I imagine that I'll never get to spend this much time with her again. <laughs> she starts kindergarten in September. Things are changing. Um, but yeah, I just appreciated that you lifted that up, that there was also this you know, some, there was joy in, in that being at home together. So I just wanted to respond and share that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I love talking about that aspect of our lives because we don't get too often. And the perception always is so much like, so negative and down and, and dreary. And it's like, if we live awesome lives, <laughs> you know, we are happy, we have joy, we have excitement, we are not looking to be fixed, like we're good. <laughs> so yeah. I, I love, yeah, having opportunities to share like, you know, our power and our excellence and our joy and, and, and those things too. And, and not to, like I said, dismiss or negate the opposite, but just because we don't have enough platforms to share share the good so yeah <laughs> great to also be able to do that yeah hi um i yeah i wanted to say um the thing that you said in ingrid that resonated with me uh the most is like if you need to solve a problem ask a disabled person <laughs> to do <laughs> it <laughs> um I find that very true of myself. I mean, I say that I'm a good problem solver, but um, I do live up to that reputation. Um, and the other thing too is um, in terms of um, being told um, of, about uh, infertility or possible um, infertility, that was also my experience, which I thought was like, I don't know. Um, I did ask for evidence <laughs> that supported that. <laughs> um, and I didn't, when I asked, when I asked the doctor, like, where's the evidence that that's the, 
the case, I didn't actually get a response back. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, because uh, they're very negative. Like even when I was pregnant with my eldest, he tried to get me, you know, the medical um, industry tried to get me to have an abortion. And I was like, no, are you crazy? You just told me I can have kids and I'm keeping, it, keeping my baby. And then they were like, oh, well, there's a great high chance that, you know, your baby will be born with Down syndrome. Not a problem. Like, like he was like trying to find these disorders that would, you know, I'd be so like, you know, I'd, I'd want to terminate the pregnancy. And I was like, I don't have a problem with my child having Down syndrome. <laughs> don't have a problem with my child having a disability. You know, so it, it, it's interesting like the, the ways and the lengths um, that, you know, different components of society will go to to tell us that we, we're, we're not equipped to be parents. We're not going to be good parents. Um, we, we'll, we will only um, produce uh, children with disabilities. Like there's something wrong with that. Like <laughs> a disabled life is a beautiful life. And the idea that that would encourage uh, need to have an abortion, like just talking about it again, just irks me. Like it's just, you know, and it, that was like 27 years ago. And I'm, I'm, I'm not sure the needle has moved that much. And it, it's, it's really sad in so many areas of oppression, whether it's racism, um, whether it's, you know, discrimination against sexual orientation, whether it's, you know, um, ableism, that that needle hasn't, it, it's moved but I mean, it, it should be, it should be done. It should be over at the other end completely. And, and but it's not in all aspects, the fight continues. Really this is Nikki. Oops, sorry. This oh, is Nikki speaking. Uh, thank you so much for that. Uh, I believe we have a question from, please forgive me and correct me if I pronounce your name wrong, Kia. Kia. Kia, thank you. Thank Go you ahead. So yeah, um, I just want to start by saying, um, thank you and just, you know, sharing my appreciation for everything that's been shared thus far. These are really, you know, really important and great conversations. And I'm particularly struck by something Ingr Ingrid just said um, in terms of a disabled life is a beautiful life. Because um, I think it's something that's, you know, it's so important for me to, I mean, it's important for all of us to remember, but I think, you know, because of ableism, it tells us, yeah, like, all, like you've all eloquently been sharing um, that, you know, these lives are less than. And so mm -hmm. I'm curious, the um, provincial election is coming up um, in the next year or so. And, you know, there's been, you know, it was talked about how, you know, this particular conservative government has, you know, really, you know, screwed over <laughs> disabled people in lots of different ways. Um, so I'm curious to hear from any of the panelists or maybe even other, well, the other panelists, like if you have um, kind of ideas or suggestions, or if you're aware of any kind of initiatives to do kind of like lobbying and organizing around the election. Like, I mean, of course, I, you know, I'm an abolitionist when it comes to, you know, kind of state affairs. And so I, I deeply recognize that, you know, like the government in general is not here for most of us. Um, and, but, you know, I also recognize how, you know, the presence of certain municipal bodies or par parties, whatever you want to call them, has direct impact on the way we live our lives and et cetera, et cetera. So I'm curious if you folks have done any thinking around that, if you know of any kind of organizing efforts um, that, you know, folks here can support um, just because I'm, yeah, I'm just thinking about next, I'm thinking about the provincial election. I'm thinking, you know, this is a great time, you know, Doug Ford's rate, like the Conservative Party's ratings are in the toilet. You know what I'm saying? Like, I feel like we have a great, like, with, like, we have a chance, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> um, yeah, so that's uh, my question. Thank you for um, inviting me to ask the question. Yeah. Thank you so much for your question. Um, I, I don't know of anything yet. Um, I have been having talks around, you know, not serious, just like, you know, conversations around uh, the election and, um, you know, community engagement and things like that, but nothing at all concrete. I have nothing to offer concrete at all. I don't know if any of the other panelists do, but definitely that is something uh, that is needed. And if, and if you are going to start something, like, let me know. <laughs> I'll be there to support. <laughs> Um, Terry Lynn speaking. Um, I don't know if I can answer your question directly, but I can I can do some um, answering of it indirectly. Um, my I'm very lucky in that like Toronto Centre is predominantly NDP MPPs. 
um, and that has been super helpful for our family um, even before JC was born because it, it we're in you know we're still in that time period and um, Suze Morrison is a fantastic advocate and ally um, for um, the disability community and the indigenous community and so whenever I have um, like a like an issue a political issue that's like uh, really focuses on on disability and other uh, specific marginalizations I do I do like <coughs> with her and and with particular NDPs and um, I'm also often in contact with um, um, the op oppositional health critic which I think was important I'm forgetting his name now Joel oh Joel Harden there we go um, so like those kinds of actions uh, for me um, have been helpful in the sense that um, like I know that the conservative government is not serving the people I'll just say that mm -hmm. yeah I would I would quote your daughter Terry Lynn and say it's foxed <laughs> exactly <laughs> Yeah, I, I similarly, I'm in, I'm in NDP writing, uh, uh, Davenport and, uh, yeah, I also, I'm not sure yet how I'm going to be involved or mobilized. I'm currently starting to support someone who's hoping to be Canada's first, uh, non-binary MP, uh, oh. named Nicole Robichaux. And they are, uh, they are very invested in, in, in anti-ableism. And, and so I'm hoping that they might, um, have an impact that said that hope is tenuous <laughs> it's hard uh, to feel yeah. hopeful in 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 our politicians sometimes no matter how aligned they might be because it, because of the system they're working in mm -hmm. true wonderful thank you for your contributions and for that great question um i think that's super important and a great way to kind of put some action items to what we are talking about today because um, these are very important messages that, you know, as Igor was saying, like all this, oh, well, as all our speakers were saying, that we have all of this quote unquote new awareness about how, like, you know, isolation or lack of access to protective equipment or other aspects of disabled life are now like blown up for the whole world to like see and experience. And now we, you know, have all the mental health support numbers available everywhere. Now we have like, you know, I don't know, like protective equipment that's like fun or like, I don't know, like we are finding ways now to mitigate the circumstances that people have already been living in. And so I think that's an awesome question. And I see another question from Marjorie in the chat. Um, I can read that out loud, Biggie. I know the chat is <laughs> your thing, but I'm on the mic, so, okay. <clears throat> I have found that my disability has made my son more resilient, more creative, a solution finder, and more, more appreciative and grateful of the little beautiful things and bigger ones, more resourceful and I can go on. My question, have any of you caught yourself having an internalized ableist discourse at any point affecting how you see yourself as a parent or as you parent? And if you did, do you have any tips as to how not to get caught up in this? That's a big question. <laughs> it is a big question. I I I feel like I could um, speak to that just by giving one example. Um, when JC was like um, eighteen months, I think. Uh, so the it it was um, was that the pand I think the pandemic had started, and um, she got. Um, she got stuck in the elevator and I was on the first floor and she got stuck in the elevator by herself. And I was like swearing, I'll just say swearing so much. Um, and um, I had to call 911 because we do have security in the building, but I couldn't find them anywhere. And I was watching like on the first floor, you can see the numbers and she had gone to the parking garage. Um, and so hence like calling 911 right away and like just my immediate thoughts was, were like, okay, definitely had parent guilt and it wasn't my fault by the way, but it was the damn elevator. <laughs> um, but also like, I was just like, shit, if I could just walk to the 
bleep bleep parking garage, this would all be good. <laughs> right. And I still think about that. I still have anxiety when we're going to the elevator, et cetera. Um, and I, I guess like in that situation, um, it wasn't so much like lack of acceptance of disability, but it was like, the, like the terror that like my kid is going to get run over by a car. <laughs> right. So that that's my, um, my, the example that comes to mind immediately around that particular time. Mm -hmm. I want to say for the, the first part that there was a, a statement before the question came and I want to say yes to that because disabled people, we raise amazing kids. <laughs> we really do. We, 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 are, we are raising the future. They are, are so inclusive. They are solution finders. They learn from us that, you know, to be creative, to, to rethink, to assess, like, you know, talk about critical thinkers, <laughs> like we raise them by default, <laughs> you know, so yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. We raise really resourceful children. As for your other question, I, I want to tell you a, a couple um, or examples or how, where that comes into play for me. It's when my kids are involved in sports because I can't see them. And you know how much kids want their parents to watch them. They want you watching them. They want you cheering for them. And I've always felt in those situations, whether it's on the field and my son was playing soccer or whether it was with my eldest daughter, who's an actor, who's always wanted to be an actor when she's on stage or, you know, when my, my other daughter was swimming or doing gymnastics, I'm, I'm looking, but I don't know where they are. Sometimes you come back, you know, when the, you weren't looking in the right way I, I went over there or you know what I mean or those hurt feelings or or other parents telling me oh gosh so and so is amazing and it's like you know smile but you know there's this envy because you're seeing how great my child is and I'm not you know and, and so you know that pain that comes from that feeling of lack then or feeling that they're missing something because you know I'm, I, I am cheering but deep down inside they, they know that I'm not really seeing them. And is that hurting them? Am I leaving a hole in their heart? But getting to that place of understanding that every parent um, has something that, you know, you're not good at or, or something. And, you know, every parent and every parent, you know, drops the ball sometimes or, or whatever it is, or, or makes mistakes or screws up or can't do something. You know, I remember when my, my eldest would get really mad at me because as far as she was concerned, I could do anything and and when anything skipped she was like you're doing it intentionally it's like no or she'd ask me a question i didn't know the answer she'd be like why won't you tell me and i'm like i don't know yes you do so i, I think it's okay and i think the fact that you're aware of it right there like you're you're gonna you're gonna be okay it's it's okay to have that and to feel it but the fact that you're aware of it when it comes you know talk yourself through it work through it give yourself some, you know, words of affirmation, remind yourself that, you know, that your disability is, is doesn't make you a deficient parent, that able-bodied parents screw up too, they have accidents, their kids get lost, like whatever it is. So that, that would be, that would be my advice, that it's all good. Yeah, I, I would echo that and also really relate to sometimes getting caught up in it. It's, I have, you know, grieved and felt uh, fr so frustrated when I can't do um, things with my daughter or for my daughter. I've also had some scary moments where I, she knows I can't run and for the most part will stay close to me and, you know, is getting used to that, but of course forgets and wants to run away. <laughs> um, and, uh, or times I have felt really jealous of what, other people can do with her. I was watching her and my, you know, partner lying on a frozen creek in the winter, making uh, um, snow. Uh, what do you call it? Snow angels. Snow and angels. and I couldn't get down the hill to where they were, and my heart filled, you know, enjoying and seeing them down there. And I just also, I really wanted to go do it too, and I couldn't. And mm -hmm. and it's uh, there are times where yeah, that that dialogue will come in of of that then connecting to self worth. Um, that I'm not good enough. Um, and sometimes that's more present than others, right? Like we all have our good days and our bad days. 
Um, but similar, like I, you know, with like what Ingrid said, it's just, you know, seeing those thoughts come and go, understand that they're normal and understand that other people have them too. The non-disabled parents mm -hmm. who are also informed by ableism and sexism and also wrestling with all kinds of garbage ideas about their self-worth when they make mistakes. Um, but just, I hear you like those moments can be hard. And, and so it's, yeah, just trying to slow down and, and um, the affirmations is such a good idea or, um, you know, other kind of mindful practices to, to just accept that, those feelings and, and, mm -hmm. and yeah, assert what your strengths are and, um, and uh, try to, you know, work through it. <laughs> Absolutely. No parent can give it all. So focus on, on what you do do. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Those are some really powerful tips and I can very much appreciate, um, you know, having to combat those internalized systems of whatever that <laughs> crop up in like the strangest moments or even like sometimes when we feel very confident in our abilities, um, there are moments where we're still reminded um, you know, like there are some things that we can and cannot do. Um, and so that's it's really important that we're having this conversation as well. And I can appreciate yeah. it. Can I add a, a thought I was just had as you were saying that Poma, is that okay? Yes. Um, I think something, I mean, you know, what we're seeing and hearing and feeling in this panel is the power of representation. So even being able to voice those thoughts and know that you're not the only one with them. Um, and the power of community. I have found Instagram I've, I, has done so much for my <laughs> disability parenting. I've just found so many other disabled parents there who are talking about the stuff that happens every day, who are celebrating their strengths, who are showing themselves as, you know, living their beautiful disabled lives and their beautiful families. And, and, um, and, and it's really powerful. And that's something that has helped me combat some of that um, ableism because I'm, I'm seeing other, I'm getting other information to challenge um, what I've been fed beforehand, what we've all been fed, right? In mainstream media. And now there are these ways that we can access our own media and create our own media. Um, and uh, so I have found that useful um, with just finding other disabled parents and going, oh yeah, okay. <laughs> Absolutely, I have to second that. You know, it just brought to mind, um, uh, um, incidents that I've <clears throat> had like uh, with my girls like going into um, you know the change room with them and having other mothers like grab their kids and pull them close um, because of you know of their perceptions of me and, and what they think that I, I'm, I'm a danger and, and what am I doing in there and having people complain that I you know I shouldn't be in that change room and stuff and just the loneliness of those experiences sometimes and it wasn't until like I, I wasn't as connected but man connection is so so important we can discount that sometimes but you need that and you need to see, um, you know, and to be around and be able to communicate with others who who get you and can affirm you because you get so much, so much negativity um, on the outside. Like there was a point in my life, um, it was funny, I was just discussing this with my brother recently. I didn't leave my house for three months straight. And, and, and that was willingly, it was because I was so fed up and so tired with the stairs, with the comments, with the name calling, being spit on, being refused service, being, and it's like, I just was like, why can't people just find their own business? It's not a matter of, I don't care like what you think, but why does what you think of me have to impact my life too? Like, can you just think it and go on about your business and leave me alone? Like, I don't owe you an explanation. I don't owe you anything. I'm not bothering you, but you go out of your way to make my life miserable. And it, it took one day, my husband said to me, my husband has a way of, he tells you a story about something. Like he doesn't say, this is for you. He just catches it and like, that, he tells stories as a note, but you know the stories for you <laughs> and the, the moral of the stories for you. So he told me this story um, one day about, um, uh, th this woman but the, the moral of the story was that when you accept what you feel are your perceived imperfections no one can use them against you and that is what pulled me out of that that 
recognition, that realization that, you know, you're so true. I am allowing people to hurt me. I am, you know, willingly absorbing this and taking it in. And it was to the point where I was even looking for it when I went out. So I was like, I'd pay attention to who was being scornful or whatever, instead of just ignoring them. Like I'd miss the smile and I'd see the ugly face. You know what I mean? So it was really an important wake up call to say, you know what? Yeah, you're, you're, you're actually arming them. You know, and that once I, I just say, F you, I love me and I don't business what you, you think about me, that freedom, that's where liberation came. You know, and, and so it, it is important to the, yeah, to have connection to community, to others, to see yourself represented and to where you're going to be accepted and affirmed. Like we, we need that to fill our cup back up, right? Because that was what was happening to me was that I was being emptied and I wasn't, you know, ever in a place or position, not ever because my family loved me, but I was blocking that filling back up of my cup and giving my power away to these people who didn't even care about me. So we need, we need to pay attention to who loves us and forget about the rest of them. They don't factor, they don't matter and take back your power. You'll live a much happier life that way. Yes, those are some really amazing points and um, have sparked a lot of thought on my end, namely that in all the excitement, I forgot to introduce myself. <laughs> And so, hello, my name is Poba Pepe. I use she, her, and he, him pronouns. I am a Black lesbian living in Parkdale, Toronto. Um, I am a nurturing assistant, and so I provide assistance to physically disabled people, namely Terry Lynn, <laughs> about um, just with parenting tasks, um, things like that. I am a second year student in the George Brown College Assaulted Women's and Children's Counselor and Advocate Program. Um, I spent my second year online, um, which was incredible because the nature of the program, you know, as you may be able to guess by the name, is that we're dealing with these very heavy, very traumatic topics. And so doing online schooling, being isolated in that sense, um, has not only made me more thoughtful about, you know, the material that we learn about, but how we learn about these things and what it means to have, you know, community around you that you know, understands or can reflect your experience. Um, so as an able-bodied person, I experience um, disability in the form of neurodivergence and mental illness. And so for me, um, something that's been very important, like Krista was saying, you know, finding communities online of people that have like these creative, not even necessarily solutions, but just different stories have different, methods of doing things that you know the colonial discourse tells us that we don't have access to or that are just flat out wrong and that's been very important to me that community sense because something that i've seen recently is um, a lot of people with experience of like you know adhd and like autism and other developmental um disabilities um just kind of demystifying like the day-to-day -day, their day-to-day -day experiences outside of the things that you get when you Google, you know, saying like these are the neurotypical boxes that this person doesn't check. How can we then flip that discourse to say these are how I find creative solutions in my everyday life. These are the things that they don't want you to know, <laughs> incidentally. And so it's really awesome to see that reflected in such like a frank and honest way in the form of this panel. And I'm really grateful and excited to you know, number one, have met Terry Lynn through, um, you know, my colleagues at George Brown College and to also, you know, have the opportunity to work with her on this amazing project. And so, um, yeah, that's, that's me. <laughs> I've been sitting here for two hours now <laughs> and you folks didn't know anything about me. Um, <laughs> I have a shaved head. I have black hair. I wear gold glasses and two gold chains. I'm wearing a blue shirt with a white one underneath. And again, I'm in my kitchen. <laughs> so yes, that's me really quickly. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. Are there are there any other like um questions or like even um like emails from um from the email that we shared earlier, Maggie? 
Mickey speaking. Uh, there are no questions in the email, but while we're waiting for more questions, I have a question actually for oh. the panelists. Um, I just as as um, we the vaccines start rolling out and we start seeing cities opening up more, um, and the, we see this real push towards a return to quote unquote normalcy. I, I just wonder what are your hopes for how we start to continue to move through what still is a pandemic, still a global pandemic, um, amid the desire for normalcy or amid the desire to go back to what people wanted as normal. And again, I think just going back to the conversation about the creativity and um, that disabled communities, disabled folks, disabled activists have demonstrated in how to live differently. What are your hopes for moving, continuing to move through the pandemic? That's a great question. Um, I don't have an immediate answer. To say, is someone having some thoughts that they want to share? I didn't want to hog the time. <laughs> I don't go want to going back. <laughs> like, we need to go forward. Things need to change. We need to do different. This getting back to normalcy, no, not for us. We don't want that. <laughs> we don't want that. We we want you know our, our voices to be upheld, to be heard, to be included, to be a part, um, to be taking leadership in the things that the areas that concern us. Um, to be informing on and to be responsible for the rollout of any initiatives. Uh, we need the, the support for our community to finally, you know, be where it should be. It's been, it was dismal before, it's been pathetic through the pandemic. Oh my Lord, that measly $600 that took so long to come. <laughs> you know, it, no, it's pathetic. We need different, we need better. Um, we've been on this cycle, this circuit that has never really changed, you know, of, of, you know, the disability community just being pushed to the bottom, being pushed aside. And every once in a while, they kind of, you know, throw you a little carrot, you know, no, we, we want our full rights. We want to be at the table, full participation. We want, you know, to be supported, um, you know, financially. And, and in, in order to, you know, to be leaders and, and to be leading, um, you know, and to stop this nonsense of doing things for us. We don't need things done for us. We need you to get out of the way and, and, and stop, you know, blocking us, you know, from getting the things done that, that we need to get done. Like, yeah, we need different, we need better. Um, and so this whole build back better um, you know, great slogan, uh, but words don't be anything. Like we, we need that to be real. And in order for that to be real, we have to be there and we're still not being um, involved to the capacity that we should be. You know, we're not. We've seen in every aspect of this pandemic from, you know, the vaccine rollout to, you know, to, you know, supports and the, the PSW, like everything has been like dismal and pathetic. You put us in charge of it and see what happens. We'll show you how to do it. You know, that's what I want to see. Yeah, I I don't have much to add to that here, here. Um, that's what we want, that's what we need. What I hope, I hope that um, everyone moves forward with a greater compassion, a greater awareness, um, and an investment in, in inclusion and access for people with disabilities, for people with mental health, for people who need to work remotely, that maybe some of the stigma has been, has been removed from that now that the non-disabled, the mm -hmm. muggles have uh, had to face it. Um, I hope for that. Um, and, and we'll see how it unfolds. But um, I mean, I, yeah, I, I hope that some people have had their eyes open to what's possible. I hope that they remember, like Ingrid said, you know, ask a disabled person. I hope they remember our knowledge um, and and call on us um, and involve us in, in the right ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, Terry Lynn speaking. I just wanted to um, touch on two points um, and I hope I can do it justice. I just wanted to speak to um, disabled people's economic capacities um, that it's not been fully tapped into. And of course, there are folks with disabilities 
um, that maybe can't work at the moment, but for the most part, um, we do have a significant underemployed population and that's not due to lack of job applications or effort or wanting to be um, working. So that's one aspect that I think, um, I, I always think it needs to improve, it needs to improve um, far more and that people include disability more in leadership positions um, and boards and commissions and, and stuff like that and, and paid roles. So I think that's really important to me. Mm-hmm. And the other thing that I, that I will say, and I hope it's not too much of um, like a, uh, just a, a personal like annoyance is that when the pandemic hit, all, and it, like this initially shocked me for like five minutes and then I just laughed. When the pandemic hit, like, everyone wanted to use our transit system like everyone wanted to use wheel trips and that was so bizarre to me um and the i continue to get like emails about um if you want to take wheel trans to your vaccine like that's fine and when i say i'm getting the emails that's one thing but these emails are going out to a broader population that didn't previously use accessible transit at all. So, and I'm not, listen, I don't really use wheel trans. It doesn't really work for me, <laughs> but I, I just found it like so fascinating and so foxed. That's what I'll say. <laughs> I didn't even know that. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the things, so just um, to respond to that, I guess, is like, um, one of the things that happened, um, especially when the pandemic first hit is like, um, they were saying for, so for people who thought they were COVID positive, that they didn't want them on um, the conventional system, that they wanted them to take wheel trans so fewer people would be exposed. Um, the problem with that is that they still were offering rides to um, um, previous wheel trans users, but they didn't know that they were being exposed to COVID or potentially being exposed. So yeah, that just, um, it blew my mind. Yikes. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, it's incredible. Some of the things that I guess, or not things, but rather structural inequalities that, you know, a lot of people have had the privilege of never having to like think about. Um, and as an Ontarian, I would like to use the example of like, you know, the, the opening and closing you know, I think there was a day or a period where we were open for maybe three or four days before we closed back up again. And, you know, now people or, you know, a lot of like able-bodied people or financially secure people or, you know, even people that maybe don't live in hotspot zones are saying like, how can I access these things? I need like my special foods. I need my clothes. I need all of these things. And so that's like one kind of like microcosm of what I feel is a broader call to looking at the structures that we live under and the people that are making the decisions um, that affect our day-to-day lives. And I really hope that in people, at least from what I've seen becoming more critical or more involved in our governments or policies and those kinds of processes, I hope that you know, we can take that momentum you know, and keep running with it when we are in the post-pandemic days Um, And we still have all of the impacts of COVID and the colonial systems that we are experiencing this pandemic under. I hope that there could be some momentum around that the same way there has been momentum around people not wanting to wear masks and like organizing to march down Young Street every Saturday, you know, (laughs) that kind of thing. Um, I guess something, another thought that I had was just how much of, again, colonization just really steeps these um, really, not minimal, but very like personal interactions that we have, like down to the way that you interact with your child that you've known all their life, um, that you have raised in your environments, plural, Um, you know, even the way that our family structures look um, in the sense that we are not all going to have the mother father, son, daughter, family structure. And that is not all we're meant to have. We are meant to have chosen family. We're meant to have friends. We are meant to have like, you know, sometimes kind strangers in the park that could help you or things like that. And so 
when we are cut off from things in such an immediate way that looks like a lockdown or a stay at home order, I think that also illuminates a lot of the structures that we are operating under that don't make sense for everybody. Um, and so I think at least what I'm hearing now in this talk is that there is <laughs> a lot to work from. And um, even if that just starts like in an intra-community sense where we can uplift and support the people that, you know, um, maybe need a couple dollars or someone to talk to on the phone. Things as medial as that are very major, I think, especially at this time. Yes, amazing. Um, so we are at 710 now. We have um, another 20 minutes blocked off for this panel. I want to invite any other um, attendees or, you know, even if panelists have questions for each other, I would love to really invite that in these last uh, 20 minutes of the panel. And then it's, it's also okay to end early if, um, if people don't have questions. Um, well, I wanted to throw something out with the whole um, movement to defund the police and looking towards more community-centered ways of caring. Like, how would that look for our community? What should that look like? I'm wondering if anybody has, you know, any ideas. Like, I was just talking today about how it's so interesting that things that impact our community greatly, like you know, violence with the police where over half of those incidents involve persons with disabilities. And yet, you know, I, I think that our voice isn't as centered as it should be. And so that we still have to, you know, really be pushing for that. So, you know, in those, those talks and those conversations around community safety, you know, I, I am wondering like, you know, what's needed for our particular community in that, um, you know, what could that look like if anyone has sure. any, any ideas? Sure, hi Ingrid, um, it's Terry Lynn speaking. I don't know if I caught the whole question, but I did also try to read the, um, um, yeah, um, I don't know, you're in, you're in Toronto, right Ingrid? Yeah. Yeah, have you spoken with Scott McKean from the city of Toronto? Yep. <laughs> I have actually. <laughs> um, many of my conversations, I mean, I don't, I'm not like, um, so my more, my most recent conversations around that have been with Scott McKean um, and previously also um, with Kristen Wong Tam at the city of Toronto. Um, I know that they're often um, like, again, we're currently in COVID, but like the, that's been my connection to those um, kinds of things. Um, I think I hear what you're saying, but please correct me if I'm wrong, just because I missed a bit of what was said, um, that um, a lot of the defunding the police has not focused on disability, even though folks with disabilities are disproportionately impacted by that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel you. I. <laughs> <laughs> um, that it that does happen that is happening and I um and I feel like even when those talks are organized disability is significantly underrepresented yeah. um so what I could offer um is that if if you have energy for that and if you would like to do something together or or contact um the respective groups together I'm happy to um I'm happy to like have tea with you and that's uh, great you know, any any day of the week um but it um it is part of the discussion that gets lost because I don't know if um if you know about this Ingrid or if other folks on the talk are interested in this um but there is still a vulnerable person list um that the police have um that's specific to disabled folks um, and a lot of people in the disability community were very much against the vulnerable persons list in terms of the police holding it and keeping it. Um, and what it was supposed to do um, from a policing perspective is like adequately send someone assistance or like, um, or like take extra care in that space, mm -hmm. having be on the vulnerable persons list. But actually um, what it did do is 
people don't want to be seen as vulnerable persons or marked in that way. And it didn't actually change the way the police interacted with these mm -hmm. people. So it was a huge breach of privacy for the Toronto disability community. Um, and, and that list didn't go away. It still exists. We just, it, it, it just wasn't in the media anymore. Wow. Well, I definitely welcome tea with you also anytime, Terry. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. But very seriously, like if you have the energy to do that and you want to shoot me an email, um, I'm game for it. Okay, excellent. Thanks. Uh, there's a question in the chat from Kaya um, asking if any of the panelists have GoFundMes or any other fundraisers that um, we can donate to. Um, we will also have like other resources or anything. Um, your like social media or like website links will all be available um, after the panel. Um, I'll use the same centralized email list as the Eventbrite registration to circulate those. So that would be um, a great opportunity if there's anything, any initiatives that you would like to have people either spread awareness of or donate to. Um, Terry Lid's suggestion is to donate to the School of Cities and or the Global Center for Disability Studies at the University of Toronto. So that's a great place to start. Um, and uh... I would say I don't have a GoFundMe or or a, a personal fundraiser, but I would say my work is available in the world. I have I've released seven albums as a singer songwriter. You can stream them, buy them on Bandcamp and Spotify and Apple Music and all of those places. If you can't financially buy them, you can share them. Um, that's always a huge support. And um, I published a book, a memoir last September called How to Lose Everything. It's uh, currently available in print and ebook, and the audiobook is supposed to be coming out any day now um, that, I, uh, that I read. And uh, again, that's available wherever you buy books or download books, but it's also available through the library. And if you read it or want to share and talk about it on social media, that's an enormous support. So if anyone wants to, to, to dig into more of my work, that's available in those places. Excellent. I too do not have um, a GoFundMe, um, but I am on social media, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and I have my own website and hopefully that'll be provided. And if you um, ever need a speaker, that's what I do. <laughs> so you can look me up, follow me, and uh, yeah, I'd love to continue to engage with people. Uh, yeah, um, I'm on social media, I'm not. Listen, if someone wants to give me like a social media, like we can do a gift exchange of like teaching me how to do it. It always stresses me out so much, but I do respond, I do. It's just not, um, it's not my, my strong suit. And I just wanted to say out loud, I guess, um, I, I did make those suggestions. I do still think the Global Center for Disability Studies would be happy to have a donation. They did significantly fund us today. Um, Professor Lowe is saying, please don't <laughs> donate um, to School of Studies necessarily, but, but to an organization. And there are two organizations that I really appreciate, which is North Workers for Persons with Disabilities. That's one organization and the Ontario Federation for Cerebral Palsy. Um, both organizations are, are in some respects um, like uh, disability specific, which I, which is always like kind of a limitation for me because I have so many disabilities that, um, that it would be nice to donate to a disability organization proper. Um, but alas, those are two great organizations that I think would uh, very much appreciate the money, um, would do excellent things with the money and they do have leadership within them um, of folks that are disabled. And thank you so much. I'm so excited about how all of this came together. And now my stress does not have to be related to this talk, but it was all very <laughs> much worth it. Yes, it was great. Thank, thank you so much.
Yeah, an encouragement to all the disabled parents out there. You're awesome. Yeah. You're doing your thing. <laughs> yeah. And yes. the other thing too is um, if there's any like reservations around social media or posting or publishing this talk or anything, like if you change your mind, we won't post it immediately. Please just shoot me an email, shoot pull my email, let us know, and we will like switch things up. I just wanted to offer that in terms of consent around, around things. Okay. All right. Beautiful. Yes. And um, I can confirm that I spent all morning watching um, Krista and Ingrid's YouTube videos. And just like finally <laughs> through like your awesome content. Um, <laughs> so yeah, there's no shortage of like amazing like initiatives and creativity happening in this room, um, whatever that room looks like <laughs> and beyond. Um, and so yeah, thank you all so much for your amazing contributions this talk was great <laughs> um, um yeah of course i've just got course. one ps i realized specific to this topic today and maybe it's something you can share pomo with the resources is um a couple years ago i wrote an article for cbc parents about disability and representation and i made public my maternity photos um and the post went viral and uh and there was an incredible response to it but connected to the power of representation and to seeing um uh disability and parenting and celebrating it and lifting it up um i'd really love to share that piece with people awesome <laughs> all right thank you so much oh it's cindy from ofcp no way i didn't even know that <laughs> Thank you for making yourself known, Cindy. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, that's great. I feel so good about that now. Okay. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, I feel like I, my heart feels full. <laughs> okay. I'm sending love. I'm going to sign off if that's okay. <laughs> awesome. Have a good night, everybody. Thanks, oh, Thank thanks, you. Have a good Tony. night, everyone. Thanks, Marjorie. Oh, Bye, thank everyone. You everyone for this amazing amazing and inspiring talk panel you all are so inspiring and resilient thank you mm -hmm. uh, for all the good lessons um, to share today thank you awesome. okay. bye